audio hello can you guys hear me okay test one two test one two and if you can hear me okay can you see the screen okay and see me okay I know there's a delay, so I'll just kind of chill back and assume that it is working with no issues. And then let's test your audio, Mike. Say something. Oh, um, yeah. Yo. <laughs> okay. What's going on? It looks like people can't see and hear. Looks like the overexposure here. Hold on, let me fix this. I can check on my end. I can hear you great. That should be good, at least for now. Yeah, everybody says it sounds good, looks good. Okay, let me just make sure I have all of the appropriate windows open for ease of navigation. And then I have the chat open. All right, um, I think you can pop out the chat. Let's see, pop out chat. Uh, I don't know if I can keep it on top but what i can do oh you guys can't see it anyway huh well maybe you guys can i don't know we'll see in just a second uh, i wonder if there's a way though i can like overlay it but it's okay i can just kind of do it this way yeah i can see the chat it is popping up all right so i'll just kind of go Actually, you know what? I'll probably just put it back down here and I'll just look down. That way I can keep keep my hands free a little bit. Hello, everybody. Welcome. It's been a while. <laughs> Hope you guys have been enjoying all of the archived videos. Uh, Mike has been diligent about putting those up. Thank you, Mike. Everybody said yep. thank you. <laughs> yep. uh, and he's been learning some yep. Blender. That's been, yeah. that's been pretty awesome. And I think the last time I really did stream too was um, before the pandemic. Is this correct? I don't remember if yeah, it was. I think so, yeah. Which is crazy to think about. <laughs> yeah. right? There was a time where the world was in order. <laughs> You've just been holding it down with uh, class demos. Yeah. I, um, which you see a lot of great stuff. Yeah, I did a lot of things uh, during this, this time away from YouTube. And just kind of social media stuff. I'm starting to get back into it uh, because I'm planning on to kind of go back into doing this full time again uh, for for who knows. Uh, I wanted to work in studio, which I did, and then the studio, um, you know, unfortunately shut down, uh, which is really bad timing. But you know, I learned a lot during that time. Uh, it was the very thing that I wanted to do. I wanted to work in studio so I can have experiences again. Uh, and I was in a, in, in a leadership position, which was great. And I really felt we were uh, on the uptick. So it was a shock to us all to see that the studio ultimately uh, shut down. Um, but with all that being said, the lessons learned have been learned. And now I'm back on the, the track of just kind of going back and just teaching and doing more of the YouTube stuff. Um, this was for many years my main career which is just teaching and doing tutorials and having a presence on social media doing present uh freelance and stuff like this so i'm probably gonna get back into that because i think it's probably the most appropriate with all things being considered and what that means with all things being considered uh primarily what it is is that with the pandemic i think for many of you guys listening um there has been a lot of, you know, reflection that I think people around the world are starting to have. Uh, whether you disagree or agree with how people are handling this, there is no doubt that as a as a global, like species, like humanity, um, that we we're just not really prepared for these types of things at this scale. I was talking to some good friends of mine about this. 
Uh, but I'll get into that in just a second. But ultimately, what I'm trying to get at is that it really kind of put things in perspective, you know? A lot of things in perspective for me. And even working during the pandemic at the studio, there was a lot of things that were put into my perspective. And when sometimes when things like, you know, a company shutdown happen, um, you know, especially like looking at some of my colleagues and was concerned about kind of uh, what was going to happen to the majority of us. But uh, it seems like a lot of people stuck the landing. Uh, a lot of people were, were outright hired and given opportunities that have been really, really awesome. And to me, I think that's really cool. That's really, really awesome. And I'm really, you know, thankful for that and grateful for this. Uh, what it really showed me though, was the sense of community that I really embraced and that I really love. When I was working there, that was what really drove me. It was this, you know, community-based thinking and this ability of thinking about others and helping each other out. Uh, during the project and after the project, I thought this was something really endearing to me. So it made me really consider uh, even more of my life goals. I always make these, you know, kind of existential, um, these kind of like larger macro perspectives about my, my goal and purpose. And I've discovered, you know, really, I think education and making things uh, has always been that. And I've always been advocating for these specific things. And for whatever reason, I've just kind of been moving towards this like rat race approach to everything. So it's really kind of uh, had me think about my priorities and really kind of change my perception on what it is to be successful. And as many of you guys who are my students or take my classes or listen to my podcasts and uh, or anything that I'm involved in, obviously these principled ideas have pretty much stayed with me uh it's just now a matter of like okay what's the next step so scaling back is probably the next step and keeping it super super simple i have done this thing recently in my life because i realized i was having a hard time sleeping uh where uh i was like okay you know what would i tell my students like how would i help them if they were running into this problem i said well you know you have to quantify things right so it's okay like i can't sleep like i'm just always my mind's just racing especially lately. So why? Why is this happening? What is it that I can do to begin, um, you know, begin to, you know, look into what makes, um, essentially what makes me stay up at night. And it's just, I have all these thoughts, right? And they're all running through my head and I, I feel there's so many things. And so I put together a list, uh, a list of stuff that I felt I needed to kind of just see on paper. And I have this list, and it's almost like 40, 40 some odd things, including work, family, uh, and personal ambitions. And I was like, man, there's so many things. And I was like, this is, this is probably why I'm staying up at night. I'm thinking about too many things. So I was like, all right, so I need to like start to take one thing down at a time and just slowly chip away until I have like, really just maybe like 10 things that are core to my everyday thoughtfulness. And once I have these 10 things, uh, that'd be really helpful. Because one of the things that I think I liked a lot about working in studio was that it was that very much that there's only one thing that I had to worry about, was, which was the project, the larger project in itself. And I think that was kind of the thing that I wanted to do more of. I wanted to kind of experience less responsibility again even though ultimately I still ended up with a lot of responsibility. But what I realized is that when I had, uh, you know, a lot of responsibility on one singular thing, it wasn't so bad. I was able to sleep at night, even though I was technically working lots of long hours. And so what this pandemic and all of this stuff has shown me is that you really, we don't have enough positive voices, right? We just got a lot of people that are just, upset all the time and a lot of people who are um they can't talk to each other right and this is not just unique to the states it's just in general and i go online and all i see is just bickering and and fighting and ousting each other for every little thing now 
I'm a big believer that people should be kept accountable for anything that they've done wrong. I've kept myself accountable for these types of things as well. And what I've discovered is that 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 kind of empathy for others is just very, very limited uh, that I've seen online. Um, A great example of this was a long time ago, like maybe like last year sometime, uh, there was this person who posted... And I'm, I'm keeping this apolitical. This is just a, a thing that just happened. Uh, and then you can kind of tie this to political ramifications. There was this, this person who posted on a pretty popular Facebook group. And he posted this pretty bad piece of artwork. It wasn't very good. It was kind of cartoonishly bad, right? Because it looked um, like something you would meme. And so people began to meme it. People started to kind of like you know, make fun of it. And what was interesting to me is that that forum, that Facebook group was specifically made to help each other get better. Okay. Like meaning that like, you're supposed to be posting bad artwork. You're supposed to show, Hey, I suck, but I need some help. Any critiques, any feedback. And people's natural reaction was to troll people. Like, and these are other, what I would consider pretty good artists and even some professionals. I wouldn't say a lot of them, but just I'm sure that they had some pedigree to them. But even, you know, obviously just low level and student level people were just having at it with this person, just kind of really making fun of them. And a lot of really veteran, um, thankfully, a lot of veteran and even some, you know, thoughtful individuals were just like, hey, man, they kind of reminded everybody what this place was made for. You know, it was made to help each other grow up. And so then when people began to realize this and started calling out the people who were just kind of trolling, I think the community had to take a good look at itself and say, like, wait a minute, what is this Facebook group even supposed to be anymore? You know what I mean? And what ends up happening, uh, what ended up happening is that people just started to feel uh, like there's just so much negativity. There's a lot of people like in, in, like immediately went to just trolling. Now, I think the problem with this isn't so much that people troll. I think trolling is inevitable and there's really nothing you can do about it. The, the problem is that there's just not enough people like myself. Uh, I know many, many great artists and really, really positive people who just aren't online because they just can't stand it because it's just super negative (laughs) you know everyone there is just so toxic and so they they because of their positive attitude and their forward thinking they realize they should just take a step out because that's more healthy that's what i did right like just take a step back because it's more healthy and when you do that you you know you neglect the community who's still staying there for whatever reason right because the The reality is to make it this in in this industry, you do have to be on social network. You just have to, right? Um, Because especially especially now, because of events and stuff are not a thing and they're probably not gonna be a thing until people really start feeling more comfortable with what's going on with the pandemic and all the crisis uh, that's going on around the world, uh, probably in the, the coming years, you know? And nobody's willing to take that risk. Nobody wants to be like, everybody's waiting for the first person to kind of do that thingy, like whatever it is and make the mistake and see how bad it is or how bad it isn't. Right. Uh, but no one wants to take that first step. They want to kind of just wait it out and that's smart. So now you have this place where you have to engage with audiences and, uh, individuals who are just going to talk mad trash, uh, anytime you start to gain any kind of popularity or any kind of clout. Uh, Even if you voice an opinion that's very unpopular, people will try to then destroy you. It makes you less and less, like, has less and less um, incentive to do these types of things. And I think we need to kind of start to be more responsible to each other as a community. Because just like that person may have made a mistake by posting something or sorry, uh, made a ton of mistakes by posting their artwork uh, that's not very uh, high quality. And one of their first mistakes was not to 
to to just kind of like lead with critiques and criticisms heavily ask like look i know it's like this and that but even that it's not their their problem entirely because people should have just kind of get their act together as well and all the mistakes that they made let's say making the artwork and doing all that kind of stuff that you saw um was supposed to be given criticism and given feedback in the hopes to make that person better right and i think what i've been really disappointed with just the global community and not just in the art uh is the lack of empathy for one another and it seems it seems really pessimistic and nihilistic to think that uh that we are just never going to get out of this right there is just there is just too many people that are more of the on the toxic level versus there are people that are on the positive level because most of the positive individuals are just not engaged in this stuff because just they just can't hang or they just don't want to hang because like i said before it is actually pragmatic to just stay off of social media um but i thought about this i thought about all this because i uh in terms of uh like you know my own day-to-day quality of life not being on social networks um is really a positive influence in my life almost always uh in terms of just like my own like health but when it comes to on a business side like i do have to have some social presence but then i also thought about it on this the end of like okay well there's a lot of people who are just so negative and there's so many people that are just so toxic um and there's very few voices who are not this way and trust me there's not as many in our community i think there are great ones out there that really contribute um i think my our but a good friend adam duff is one of those people i think he's great uh ross tran awesome very motivating individual right and um you know many others that are there but just it's still outnumbered compared to the people who their whole youtube uh model or social model presence uh and influence is just not very productive uh and i don't mean just on a on an economic uh economic level like making money or something like this i'm talking about like on a social level like the social currency that they are uh providing is of very low actual human value you know on a social value is just entertainment or distraction to things that could make your life better. And although my channel probably will never get into uh, like, you know, PewDiePie levels, <laughs> right? Where is he at now? He's like well, above 100,000, right? Or 100 million. He's like crazy. Yeah, I think man. so. It's, it's, cool. it's so crazy. Um, but even though it may never reach that level, um, if I can start getting to that level, uh, and never really changing my platform, the way that I teach, the way that I do this, which is providing like my archive mentorships videos, doing small miniature tutorial videos uh, with no hope or no ambition to just make more money just for the sake of it, but to just slowly build my audience like I did with every other platform and slowly build uh, and transition, I think, and mature the YouTube audience to start to realize that we are all individuals and we're going to eventually work with one another in some capacity and the accountability needs to be handled in a way where uh, imagine if this person was your neighbor or someone that lived with you you know how would you manage those tempers how would you manage those um those uh temperaments right i had a great conversation with a friend of mine who's uh, who's relatively conservative i consider myself pretty independent i don't really have any individualized um political affiliation in fact i kind of think it's very annoying that that actually exists like you're either more on the left or more on the right that whole idea uh i don't necessarily even just subscribe to because it's 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 a clear tool to divide right but anyways he leans more right and he has very cookie cutter uh, conservative outlook and you know we were talking and he said something that was really interesting to me where I really challenged him with and it really made him think for a second you know which was this idea of like hey you know like you know my immediate family people that are close to me my friends and stuff you know I care about these people I want them to be taken care of 
So obviously if they're in danger or in, in need of help, I'm more than happy to help these individuals. He's like, it's only when they're outside of my immediate circle that I'm just like, why do I have to pay these people's taxes for their medical bills and their aid for whatever that like they should have their own accountability on that level. Right. And my thought to that was that, well, what if you did make friends with any one of these people that you're talking about, like as an abstract idea, like you're, you're saying you don't want to pay for people you don't know, but what if you ended up meeting some of these people and knowing these people? For instance, uh, what if there was somebody who had a bit really unhealthy lifestyle, right? Just ate really badly. And you're saying to me, you know, why should I pay for that person's medical bills? It's their life choices led to a, a terrible outcome. And I say, that's true. It's very, very reasonable. And, and I think why I see why people have this thought. So, but what if that was your mother? Okay. Right. Like, let's say that was your mom that had led a bad lifestyle. Right. Um, would you just be like, Hey, it's up. Like it's her fault. She just needs to like fix it on her own. Or would you be like, it is her fault, but we need to kind of work together as a community and as a family to help her out. Right. To try to get out of this. And I told him, it's like, look, and I'm not the kind of individual that's like, you know, if you lead a horse to water, you force them to drink, you just lead them to water. And if they don't drink, there's really nothing you can do. Right. Ultimately. But the idea is like, you don't even take them to the watering hole. You just let them stay out into the desert to, to die from thirst. You know what I'm saying? No, we should at least take them to the water hole. And uh, from there, if their choices still are very toxic and very unmanageable, yes, that's just going to be a challenge that they're going to have to overcome on them on themselves. This is something that I do with my classes, right? I teach people how to do this very thing, like how to overcome their own personal biases, their own personal anxieties and frustrations. Um, because it is a very much a thing that they have to individually do. I cannot draw for them. You know, if I could, and now sustainable at a large scale, then absolutely. I, well, why wouldn't I want to help people like this? Maybe I can do some machine learning algorithm and help people become great artists. But uh, it's, it's just not a thing, you know? <laughs> and, you know, he thought about that. And I was like, yeah, because like you're, 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 you're allowed to feel this way because everyone you're considering is a stranger. But if I was to ask you, do you think most people that you meet are like really evil or really undeserving or decent human beings, you know? And he said, decent, you know, I was like, if you were to meet my like friends, would you think that they're all toxic? You know what I mean? And people that you wouldn't care about. He's like, probably not. Like, right. If we really got to know each other, he's like, yeah. So this, this premise of like, I have to first get to know people, um, allows you to kind of lack empathy because logically it's like, why would I care about a stranger? But if you follow the logical conclusion of what a stranger truly is, it's just somebody you just don't know yet. And to think that the world is full of people that are just straight up evil, I don't think is necessarily true. I really believe when I said earlier about the negative impact on social media, it's not that there is that so many people are really terrible. It's just that when they're online talking to each other, they paint each other as terrible people. Does that make sense? Right. Everybody is evil. Everybody is either a uh, extreme social justice warrior or uh, like a far leftist or a, you know, uh, far right Nazi white supremacist. You know, th these are common things that people say to each other, which is nonchalantly without actually challenging what they're even saying about that individual. And don't get me wrong. There are definitely people who are very, very, <coughs> very intense and very extreme on one way or another. And to just straight up call them that uh, and being accurate, my point is, doesn't change anything. Calling somebody a social justice warrior doesn't make them say, oh, you know what, you're right. Maybe I am thinking a little too intense about this. Or going on the other directions, calling somebody a racist doesn't actually turn somebody to be non-racist like can't i can't imagine unless you have a story where you've told somebody that they have been there are this thing that they may very well be this thing that you disagree with and they are that thing that you disagree with calling them that because and hoping that they would change just based off of that the the calling out 
I would like to know if this has actually worked for you. If you told people that what they are, and then they just say, oh yeah, you know what? I was totally wrong. Because in my experience, um, it is important to acknowledge what people may be for sure, but it's also important to meet them where they're at. There's a reason why they may think this way, right? There's a reason why people have these preconceived notions and thoughts. And here's what really frustrates me is that this isn't just unique to kind of politics. I think that's the most obvious thing we can talk about because you see it everywhere now, right? But it, it, it's starting to kind of like trickle down into just how other artists interact with each other, you know? And other artists just paint this picture. Oh, this person's a photo basher. Oh, this person's a 3D whatever. Like this whole se separation uh, is a amplified on social network. And I think that we need more people like who are true professionals who've worked in an industry, who've met and talked with a lot of individuals and just kind of make sure that everyone understands like it's really not as crazy as you may expect. And it doesn't mean that there's some bad actors. I am absolutely not saying that either. But there is this kind of filter that like, I think social network just really puts on everything. It just makes everything a little bit more uh, sens sensational, you know? And it's just not uh, accurate. I remember when uh, we did Lightbox, uh, you went with us too, right, Mike? And we were all hanging out. Um, you don't get that, right? When you hang out with people in like in a real way, yeah. was it like everybody was super toxic talking shit with one another, sorry, discriminating for whatever art style or preference of art? No, right? Nope. It was the opposite, actually. It felt way more like commutative. Like everyone felt like, oh man. A sense like, of camar camaraderie. Yeah, like, man, we all love art. Art's awesome. Hey, I love your artwork. Hey, no, I love your artwork. And it was just so positive. In fact, I always encourage people to go to events because when they realize that when you talk to other people, um, it's just a much more positive and uplifting experience. Uh, I remember there's one person who was on social media all the time and he was just like, I'm going to quit art. And I said, don't quit art, man. <laughs> And he's like, yeah, man, like all I see is just people talking crap and like everywhere in the world is just like evil. And like, like they, just, they just went on this whole thing. And I was like, this is just not, I don't think this is the thing that you really know anything about, my man. And I said, look, why don't you go to Lightbox? And he did. You know, and, and at first he was a little bit like, I don't know. And I was like, yeah, you just got to stay off of these networks. You got to stay off, like stop arguing people. Like, and don't worry, man. Like I find myself like, beginning like to write a paragraph of how much this person i think is just wrong just a paragraph <laughs> yeah two <laughs> paragraphs just two no, paragraphs, two paragraphs. <laughs> yeah. this motherfucker writes a novel <laughs> so 17 novels right yeah, yeah. Se seven part novel netflix series on how this yeah. person is not right mm -hmm. um and i've even before this like i used to do this thing where i would only respond uh on social networks i gave myself a quota that I would only respond to people at least um, three or four times. And after the fourth time, I, I'm out. I have, to guess, I have to sign out. You know? And it was because yeah, you, can, you can get really into it. You know what I mean? And I told him the very same thing. I was like, you just got to stay off, man. Like, it's just... And, and, and I told him, too, like, well, the reason why it amplifies social net, like, you know, media amplifies this negative behavior is because people engage with the first negative one. It's really hard to just be like, no, I don't need to respond to this. You know, like it's not going to change. Like me pointing out facts to another individual, whether I am a hundred percent right or I'm hundred percent wrong, doesn't matter. It's not a convincing tool anyway. Right. It just isn't. But like the, the thought that I might is actually more of a selfish response it's more of like you think that this is working but it, it actually isn't because we've been doing it for years and it's only gotten worse hasn't it right and what really changes is to get people to remember the humanity of a, uh, each individual and i was telling them all this type of stuff like you need to go and meet with other people and sure enough he did he went to lightbox and it was amazing it was like life-changing for him and he's just was so inspired and he couldn't believe how 
lost he made himself become. And he, I haven't seen him on social networks too often, but even still, I can see him uh, post a thing here and there, which is totally reasonable, right? But the point I'm making is, is that when you are engaging in social networks, they are trying to keep you there whether you like it or not. Meaning that if you engage with negative content, they're going to keep sending you negative content because you're engaging in it. Uh, if you're engaging in positive content, then you're going to get nothing but positive content. And for me, I always tell people, do do yourself a favor. Like, go to your social networks, something like YouTube, for instance, and just go to your front page and see what is recommended to you. Because whatever is recommended to you, I can promise you, is different from what's recommended to me. You know? And... When you realize that, then it becomes very clear that whatever you are engaging in is what the algorithm is going to keep providing you, All right? And like uh, another good one is like sharing Pinterest's homepages. Like what is your Pinterest versus someone else's? Now, Pinterest isn't politically driven for it per se, but it is definitely, um, definitely a, something that's catered to your personal preferences. Uh, I remember me and my wife were looking at our TikToks and hers is definitely more Latin influence and mama influence, right? And then mine are just more hilarious, just like a lot of hilarious memes and jokesters, right? Uh, like my favorite my favorite videos to watch on there, for instance, is comedy when people do funny things. Uh, like one of my favorite ones, like type of series that I like to see is when people read jokes and they just can't stop laughing when they're reading the jokes. Right. I think that's really funny, you know, and but some other people, you know, might have a completely different experience. Uh, and I will say that when you first jump in, you might see kind of what the majority of people are looking into, because that's why uh, those popular things are not trending. But as you start clicking things that you like and just ignoring everything else, you'll see. And something that people don't realize, too, is that all these tools you can actually click say not interested you can tell them what you're not interested both on facebook instagram i believe you can do this tic tac or tic tac <laughs> tic tock uh youtube you can go to these places and just say not interested uh you don't have to dislike the video you can just not engage in it at all and and that's a really good tool that i've been using and it keeps a lot of my platforms very focused and ultimately, the kind of the moral of why I'm saying all this stuff, I'm not trying to make any kind of statement outside of this one very specific one. All the stuff that I said before is just more of about a higher macro view of things, right? But overall, my principal idea here is that I should definitely just focus on creating content and uh, positivity on all my social platforms. Uh, be a beacon of positive thinking and beacon of reasonable thinking and helping people start to kind of get their bearings back on what's actually reality, right? Uh, and this is just true not for for helping those outside of this, but it's also helpful to do it uh, for my own well-being, you know what I mean? Because I think it's helpful to me to also just try to start to create the reality in a world that I would want to be living in. Because right now, everywhere I look, uh, it's just people are really, really going in on one way or another. And let me be a 1 million percent uh, sure too. It's like, there are some movements that I support uh, 100%. And there are some political um, positions that I support 100%. And I always try to do this one simple thing, which is lead with empathy. Meaning that if I feel pretty strongly about something, it's because of the empathetic factor. I don't really look at it any other way. So for instance, uh, I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples of what would be, you know, empathetic in the art community. And then I can give you some examples of like a political stance. So art is just like, for me, it's like everybody's will like, right to draw and style <coughs> however they prefer you know some people have very strong preferences on whether you should use 3d or 2d uh, i say that you you can do whatever the hell you want the more abstract 
and more um, niche like your artwork is, the more unique it is, then you just have to expect that there's probably not going to be a large uh, group of people that will just follow and support you. Uh, and if if that's okay, then you could totally build a business or build a lifestyle around that. Absolutely fine. There's actually no challenge there. Um, I'm sorry, there's, there isn't a big of a challenge there as maybe you might suspect. You just got to just be a little bit more clear that that's what you have to do. Um, but if you want to do something a little more popular, more generic, uh, there's nothing wrong with that either. You know, I have, I have seen a lot of people get really critical of people who do more popular styles, uh, very clearly popular styles and they get really aggressively like, um, mean to those individuals because obviously they're more popular. They make more money, uh, at least on the surface it appears that way. They have more fans. They do pretty well on everything. It just seems so easy. So it's, uh, it feels like the merit there isn't deserved, but that's just the reality of it. That's what they like to do. Um, and that's what they wanted to do. So, so be it. There's a reason why popular culture is popular culture is because the majority of people like that thingy, whatever it is. Right. And if you're like, well, it's bad. The popular culture is bad. And it's not like that type of stuff is terrible. I mean, that's, really your opinion i think the only parts that i would agree with in terms of popular uh pop culture being bad is the type of influence it may have like there are some things that are just clearly um not very conducive to the production of productivity of just the general masses so for instance um selling this idea that life is easy that they can just buy whatever they want and these types of things i think that that is a very popular thing that you would see on many uh, multiple facets of social networks but it's like it's not realistic it's not actually teaching people to kind of be less consumer based it's not teaching them how to fulfill their lives in a real way um, that kind of stuff i think is really hard hard to combat because most people do want that you know they want a, a simpler life that or they want a life that's just like full of luxury and whenever they see this type of stuff, it just, it fans that um, fantasy. But the problem that I have with it is specifically that it is a fantasy, but it is proposed that it is not a fantasy. But if you are presenting it as a fantasy and, you know, having some sort of, you know, clear message being said to people like, look, I was, you know, I was provided these certain privileges and I, or I worked really hard and decided it. It's not really easy. This is step by step. I've seen a lot of people who do this and I applaud that because that's really powerful. You know, if you just call it what it is, um, there's nothing wrong with that. I think, but people get really caught up with like, Oh, well this person didn't, doesn't deserve this stuff. And it's like, well, let's just be very clear what that means, you know? And because there are some people who, uh, you know, I would say do really, really, really like, like a large amount of work and effort and they spend a lot of time and they spend a lot of, you know, hard work doing something that isn't, let's say glamorous, like, I don't know, um, something like construction is a great example where all you're doing is building homes and you really work super hard. So if you were to compare how hard that individual works, like actually works, compared to let's say somebody who's just incredibly attractive and just put an Instagram uh, page of just beautiful pictures of them and then they make their money just being pretty much beautiful. Um, It's clearly unfair on the the premise, like the simplicity of like looking at it. But it's like, but at the same time, it's like um, just because the construction worker uh, works so aggressively hard, like physically, you know, it's really back breaking uh are we then saying that that individual should be making like where is the the cap of that like tens of millions like is it really the hardest you work um or versus like just being you know picking professions or playing the cards right because of all the stuff that you got lucky with right and that to me is really kind of a gray area right it's not as simple as like oh you know we should just pay people based off of the actual um effort Because there are people who do things that uh, are not nearly as like 
hard as construction work, but they're very smart. But then I'm also on the side of like, hey man, we shouldn't be, uh, like there is a cap in my mind of like how much money an individual can or should have in general. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so like there, at some point, having billions and billions of dollars is just a lot of money for one individual to have. It's just so much money. There's this really popular website that I like to send people. Uh, not popular, there's this funny website. It's called like Spend Bill Gates Money. Go check it out, guys. It's really funny. Like you'll be surprised how much you can buy with uh, almost $100 million or $100 billion. Um, so it's a lot. It's a lot. And so there's there's some reason to be like, okay, there is a cap in both directions we should be very considerate of. I think the problem that I've been having is that a lot of people aren't willing to have a discussion on how to meet in the middle. It's one way or another, you know? And so for me, uh, the kinds of stuff artistically, really what drives me is like, as long as nobody's genuinely being hurt or harmed, this is kind of where I land. Uh, as long as nobody's being harmed. If someone is being harmed by the actions of the other, uh, especially if they're being harmed in a way that has monetary value, then I'm going to be very critical. But even if it doesn't, um, I'm gonna be very critical of this. But I think generally speaking, we gotta be kinder to each other because even with that being said, oh, hold on, Julian. Okay. Okay, thank you, son. Love you. Yeah, and then so like whenever you would have somebody, let's say, do these like things that we disagree with, there, there needs to be a way to kind of help reform that individual to be a better individual instead of uh, going all in on destroying somebody. I think the only cases in, in which I still uh, have some, some, you know, neutral position on is just like some executive destruction of someone's livelihood. Um, because... I think there should be accountability and I actually don't know the ultimate solution to this, but I do know what doesn't necessarily help is that this kind of like uh, jury by mobs, right? Because right now, if the mob is on your side, then it's all good. But what ends up happening if the mob is not on your side, right? This, this idea of the majority rules is something that you should be very careful of because sometimes the majority may believe in something that is incredibly destructive for the community as a whole. Uh, a good example of this would be something like a, a sugar tax in New York. I think they were trying to put a sugar tax on Coke because it was, or like just soft drinks because they were like 32 ounces and they were like, they were, people were just like in the streets, like we're not going to pay more money for more sugar, like more, um, what you call it? Uh, because I got a 32 ounce soda, like, like screw you government. But then reality is like the diabetes was like increasing, uh, health and obesity was a problem, uh, because people were eating way too much sugar, but the majority rule, like the mob said, no, nah, F that give us our sugars. Like don't tread on me. And then, uh, young children and, uh, young adults and older adults are dying from diabetes. And, and interestingly enough, during the pandemic, New York was hit the hardest. And there are some clear signs to say that people with underlying conditions more are more at risk. Uh, and specifically people who are obese and have some sort of um, weight-based health ailment. So ultimately it didn't work out. I'm not saying that there was an immediate correlation, but I'm saying it doesn't help, you know? And so, so there's like, there's some real responsibility as a community we need to start thinking like we don't want to fall into this culture that we see everywhere else in the world because everywhere else like and this gets into the political stuff like for me i'm like a big fan of like universal education and health because to me it's like i don't want to have to like i love teaching i like helping individuals i like to be on a platform like youtube and all this stuff but because of where i live and what i do i have to make income to sustain any reasonable lifestyle for my family. And it would be great if there was some sort of merit-based system within our government that says, no, you can do keep doing your education because you're bettering 
the the lives of American citizens, you know, globally too as well, right? Obviously, a lot of you guys are not from America. And they would subsidize or find some way to kind of keep me in play and just check in every year to make sure that I am contributing in the way that I think I am. You know, like, oh, is this person reaching this many people? Does this person have this many, you know, recommendations? Whatever that may look like. I, I don't know what that would be engineered to look to do to kind of quantify my value. But you see my point, like, why why aren't we thinking this way? Why aren't we trying to solve this? And rewarding uh, great educators for being great educators uh, or incentivizing, in, in, like putting incentive for people to become great educators. Like maybe I wouldn't do a good job and I can see that. I can see the metric and I can see why, what I would need to do the following year to, to increase my value, you know? And right now the, the profit margin for a university is attendance. It's just, we just need more people. You know, it's not a matter of, um, whether they graduate or not, like that's great. And we can use the prestige as a, to our advantage to get people in. But ultimately you have schools that don't necessarily like make great graduates, but they just say they do. Um, and people have been conditioned that college is the only way. And so I, to me, it's just like, okay, like, the, and those are my political uh, affiliations and those are very left leaning. But to me, it's like, but why wouldn't we want to help each other in this way? And then, you know, a lot of people come back at me like, hey, you know, we'll cost a lot of money. And then uh, recently in, in the States, we dropped, how much, do you know how much this was? It was like $3 trillion in relief. Yeah. Just mm -hmm. like overnight. We're like, oh yeah, we got to do this. Yeah. And right, <laughs> mostly corporations. And, and not to say that we can just print money to solve this problem. I'm just saying there's also like, we're just spending it in lots of different ways and this is like a right-leaning position which is to be like we need to like actually question the government and keep them accountable and actually audit the government you know and government spending you know what i mean mm -hmm. but if i'm liberal i'm like no government can never go wrong according to like what a conservative perceives from a liberal and then from a liberal's present perspective uh conservatives have no heart you know they don't care about people at all you know where conservatives uh are, are actually not uh that picture in fact they are some of the people that care the most about people that are closest to them it's just this separation of other people that i think that's the this, that's the missing link right uh my friend my closest friend is what you would consider my like if i was super liberal left-leaning would be my anti aj right like he is a white man straight Christian highly conservative right leaning right uh, but he's one of the closest people in my lives I love him very de dearly you know during my brain surgery he he was one of the very few people who came and took care of me and my family when we were in need he his wife watched our kids so that my wife can stay with me during the surgery in hospital and he came and visited me and helped her so she could sleep and so he cleaned me and did all that stuff to me for me to look at this guy and be like, racist, <laughs> you know, because he has very stereotypical and prejudiced types of positions in some things. It just doesn't, it doesn't make sense. You know, it doesn't sit well. And he has said things and, and mentioned things that I thought was very questionable, but I never in my mind was thinking like, oh, this guy's like a lost cause, right? <clears throat> Irredeemable. Yeah. In fact, the opposite would always happen. I would just talk to him, just talk and talk. We would have like these long three or four hour discussions, you know, because I was never looking at him as my enemy ever, not even once. And he knows that I'm not either. So when I'm talking to him and criticizing him and vice versa, he would criticize, criticize me. And actually there's a lot of uh, conservative positions that I felt was very reasonable, you know, but I was just listening to him and he listened to me and he started to realize, yeah, that makes a lot of sense, you know? He's like, actually, I never thought of it that way. He's like, oh, that's, he's like, you're right. That is kind of a, like a effed up thing, you know? And, and then we just like have this more of like position of like, like, oh, you know what? Like we are, we are more in common than we, we think. It's just that for whatever reason, media and social interaction on the internet or outside of like the individual basis has 
you know, really put us in this position of thinking that we are, we have to hate each other. We have to fight the enemy. And when you start to do that, that's when you start to create real division. That's when you start to create real problems. And I think that like when people are online and they're trying to get good at art and they're trying to learn how to become an artist, uh, it's really hard when everybody is like, there's just so many distractions and misleading piece of information and nobody seems reasonable. Everyone seems like they're in one way or another. And then you just fall deeper and deeper into whatever hole you decide to choose. I always thought it was bizarre too. A lot of my friends, close friends of mine, uh, do this thing where they'll block and uh, unfriend people like, like as a thing both on, on both sides of the aisle, right? Both. Um, and they they just they just make it seem like, yeah, this is like a duh, I gotta block people. Like, I'm not gonna tolerate these individuals. And it's like, this toleration is the very thing we need. We need to tolerate each other. We need to be able to talk to each other and be to, to kind of get past these problems. Like I have children and there's times where I cannot tolerate them. They're just like real aggressive and real children. <laughs> you know what I mean? But I do tolerate them and I do put up with them and I sit down and I talk with them and I try to find the hope in getting them to understand the issues in which they may have caused, right? Like if my son bites his sister, he needs to understand why that's a problem. Or if my sis or his sister, you know, doesn't share with him. She needs to understand. And her reasoning and their reasoning for doing the things is always unreasonable, right? But could you imagine, like, every time I did that, I'd be like, all right, whatever, I'm just going to block this kid. I'm going to unfriend them, you know? <laughs> time for adoption. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's so it's so crazy to think of this concept of unfriending. There was a time mm -hmm. where everyone just got along, but that now everybody's, like, evil. Now everybody's, like, like a problem. Oh, camera's on. See there. Yeah. <laughs> My wife sometimes doesn't want to be filmed. I have to shower and it goes naked. Don't home. be naked. Perfectly reasonable. <laughs> Here, I'll turn off the camera for a second. Because I'm streaming. <laughs> She's just questioning me. All right. Anyway. Um, but you see what I'm saying? And, and for me, it's like, okay, it's time. So, I mean, I know I've been ranting for quite a while, but it's because it's, I'm trying to catch up. <laughs> There's a lot of things that have been going on. And I'm sure I'm going to be talking about all this stuff. I'll get more into kind of like the my thoughts on the pandemic in general and what I think people should consider. That's a lot more reasonable, right? Um, but what I will say is that I am going to start putting videos out again like I've been doing. I am going to do more regular streams because, I, like I said, I think it's time for me to kind of start to just really get back to my original mission statement, you know, help pe people. It's funny because I'm talking about all this stuff. And I'm drawing this like grotesque monster. <laughs> Tolerate people, and this is like the most <laughs> monstrous looking thing. Um, <laughs> yeah, even tolerate this guy. Yeah, tolerate him. See, tolerate him, smiling, him, dude. dude. Um, hey, he's not gonna hurt you. Yeah, and so it's it's clear to me that like I need to start doing that. I need to start Bob Ross in this a bit. You know what I mean? Like being the kind of individual that people say, you know what, like I. We, I want to be more like that, or I need to be more like someone that's kind of helping out in the industry, you know. And uh, mm -hmm. let's be clear though, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna make very clear points. Like I said, there are, there are some positions that are very polarizing, and I do have a very um, strong position. For instance, with the Black Lives uh, Black Lives Matter movement, that's for some reason is very polarizing, right? But I am in support of Black Lives Matter. You know what I mean? Like, I am like, yeah, I agree with this premise. I agree that we should care about um, the black community a little bit more aggressively. Now, what, is it, what that might mean to some people is like some sort of race war. But listen, it is not a mystery. And this is what's so weird to me. It's not a mystery that the black community has really had a hard time in America. Specifically, I can speak to this. I... I'm like half black and my dad was alive during the time when there was segregation. Meaning that if you guys didn't know anybody that might have been actually affected by this in some way, shape or form, you're you're you've been following his work for many years or just recently. Meaning that my dad had to try a little harder to get out of his circumstances because of that. 
it's not like after the Civil War in America, like Americans in general were just like, yeah, black people are equal, obviously. No, there was a war for it. And even after the war, it wasn't like people got their act together. No, like there were still people that were aggressively racist and they created laws and systems that were very racist. This is just true. And then, I mean, it's so true that during the time that my dad was barely a little little boy, he was as old as my son, my six-year-old, uh, there was a guy named Martin Luther King who fought for this very injustice and, and made the Civil Rights Movement, which again, was during my dad's lifetime, if, and especially during my grandma's lifetime, okay? But again, it, w- it wasn't like after desegregation was in effect that people were like, oh yeah, black people are cool. No, I mean, like, no. we really, it really takes a while. And as a nation, we just aren't great at forgiving each other. Like, we're just not great at saying, listen, we really effed up here, <laughs> okay? Let's like really kind of make a concerted effort to fix this, you know? That just hasn't really happened. And just to kind of give you an example that has something that's a little, that is attached to the black community. Um, if you look at uh, the legalization of marijuana, we've just legalized marijuana, right? Like most of the states in America states. Yeah, has legalized marijuana. There are still people in jail as we speak for possession or selling of marijuana. Isn't in that bizarre? States. In the United States, yeah. No, but, in those states specifically. Yeah, in those states specifically. Sorry. Thank you for correcting yeah. me. Um, so, like, we're not like, oh, you know what? Okay, let's just kind of, like, fix that. <laughs> let's let's kind of, like, revert our mass incarceration of people who we now look at as really not, like, nonviolent criminals. And technically not really criminals. They were just selling something that was, at the time, a criminal thing. But they could have been maybe making money doing it legally, right? Weed is very easy to grow. Uh, you can build a, your own business around marijuana, uh, like sales, and it doesn't have to be for consumption either. You know, but but the idea that like we looked at these people as like scumbags and criminals um, is, is is kind of crazy that we're just still like yeah they kind of are <laughs> right, and and it's even more. Uh, problematic when you look at the mo- the majority of these individuals are uh, black Americans, right? And that's kind of to my point. Uh, I was remember I was talking with somebody about this too because they were, they were saying like, well, this and that and that and this and they were talking about black culture and community and I'm like, look, man, let's be clear here. I don't think that you're wrong. I actually do think culture has a lot to do with it, even inner culture, like cultures within cultures, right? Obviously, right? But let's be let's be honest, it's, it's not the only thing to make it like put it all on that one thing is kind of uh, naive because, you know, there's this argument of black dads where the black dads, well, you know, a lot of black dads get incarcerated. Some of them don't leave by choice. Sometimes they get incarcerated for again, selling weed. This was not too long ago. This was like in the eighties. Right. <clears throat> and so uh, what I would try to say is like, but I do think, that we have to look at other things that have nothing to do with it, like black culture, for instance, like health. Health is a great one because why is it still disproportionate black individuals that are dying from diseases more than, like disproportionately percentage-wise than any other ethnicity, right? COVID-19, why did it just go straight for the black communities and start, uh, black and Hispanic communities and start murdering these people at a disproportionate rate? Is it because of COVID's like has an agenda? It's like, look, they, they don't have enough dads, so we got to kill them, right? It's clear that the echoes of Americans' past is still here with us today. Now, if you were to ask me, is there like just rampant racism here and there, left and right? Like, I don't think that's entirely true either, right? But to deny the history is kind of bizarre in my in my opinion, and it's not. And it, the craziest part is like it's not that long ago. It really isn't. And I think that's what makes it, it's it's a human problem. We can't look that far ahead, <laughs> you know? We're like, dude, that was like 10 years ago, whatever. It's like, it's, it's long, long gone. Remember um, remember that song um, done by uh, uh, the Harlem Shake song? Remember that song, Harlem Shake? Yeah. <laughs> How long ago do you think the Harlem Shake was? 
Um, that was probably 2013. Oh, dude, you're right. <laughs> oh, hey. Yeah, I think it was around out. the 2015. Well, some people might think it was longer, right? Like, how old is, is YouTube? Don't ask me. Like, how old is YouTube, right? 2006. Well, yeah, YouTube's about like 12 years old, I think. Right? That's crazy to think that there was a time before YouTube, you know? And there was. I mean, maybe like 20, no, 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 about like 16, I would have been 20, uh, about 20 years ago, 22 years ago around roughly. Uh, yeah, there was like still no such thing as like a smartphone. Maybe even like, we can go even sooner, like maybe like 18 years ago, you know? Actually, even more so probably like 14, 15 years ago. I, I could be wrong about this, but the scope in which I'm trying to speak to is like, it wasn't that long ago. And look at how much has changed, right? And so, and our, like how easily we forget. And so there's some things where like, yeah, man, look how long ago, like it was so long ago. So now imagine something that's 30 years ago, 40 years ago, even like a hundred years ago. It's like, well, that's like, that's ancient history. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's like, nah, dude, it really takes a long time for real social change, especially when the, the, the culture does not care at all <laughs> to make that much huge, significant changes. Do you hear what I mean? And so, so for me, it's a polarizing issue for sure that people are, you know, having one position or another, but I, I'm pretty clear about it. I'm like, no, this is pretty, it's a, it's an open and closed case in my opinion that we just aren't empathetic, you know, like still to the African community, like African-American community, specifically black Americans, right? Like the fact that people still try to say, well, it's their fault. Like that's, come on guys. Like we're not, we're not being helpful. If you think that people in need, need help, then maybe we should help them out. It's like, even if you make the case of somebody's, in your neighborhood setting a house on fire. They set their own house on fire, whether it was on purpose or on accident. You know, are you just gonna let them set their house on fire? Or are you gonna let the house burn to the ground and let's say kill their whole family? Or are you gonna call the fire department or call the police or call anyone who can help or maybe even yourself go in there and rescue them, right? It's like only until we see it, like this is the same thing with the COVID stuff and I'll save it for the next stream, but it's like, Unless we see it like genuinely people like dying in the streets in front of us or people that we know immediately who are next to us. Uh, it's just a bizarre sentiment that we should just start kind of like, no, 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 it's their fault. Like if you've ever had anybody who had a hard life and who really made a lot of mistakes in their life uh, that you care about deeply. Uh, think about that way you feel about this individual. And I know people who they really had to do some of the most despicable things before they were finally disowned by their family. You know, like truly disowned. You know what I mean? And it's understandable. But even then, even with that being true, they still try to forgive them. They still try to find ways to bring them back to being civil. You know, they're not like, well, it's their culture, right? No, they just say, no, we got to help them out. We got to, because this is a, an individual. And so I'm I'm kind of coming back to you guys with this premise for this YouTube channel. That's what I'm going to start doing. I'm going to start talking about art, primarily in helping people become good, but also try to, whenever these types of issues start to surface, try to come at it with a perspective that will be helpful and more reasonable. Something that's able to evolve to, like where even my opinions can change very very effectively, especially if I'm being talked to somebody who I really believe has empathy at the heart of their argument. You know what I mean? If if I don't sense that, then I will definitely challenge this premise that they have. Uh, otherwise, uh, what's the point? Like, what's the point of arguing it? You know? If they genuinely are just arguing for the sake of arguing, they're, just a contra they're contrarian by nature which I feel like a lot of these popular YouTube commentators are. And that's why I don't really like subscribing to too many of them. You know what I mean? Like they, their job, their whole job is to 
just argue. Like they just try to disagree for the sake of disagreeing, and that is not. Uh, see, the camera's off. She's like, <laughs> she's like crawling around. <laughs> yeah, um, but that's a good time to go to. Actually, she can go. Um, I saw that there was a lot of comments. I didn't get a chance to read through them. Sorry, guys, I was ranting. I uh, appreciate it. looks like there's a lot of good conversations, do you think, including metaphors in your artwork? There's some art questions. Yeah, actually, I will absolutely come back um, next next uh, stream. We'll do another one this week. Maybe we'll try to do another one in, uh, tomorrow sometime. I have, I have a lot of stuff, actually. Let me double check before I start promising things. <laughs> Let's see. Tomorrow... Yeah, can we put something on the clock for tomorrow at 2.30? Mike? Can tomorrow at 2.30? Yeah. And we'll focus okay. mostly on art. We'll just, I'll do like art answering of questions. I can see a lot of people ask that. And I definitely want to do that uh, stream. But I, you know, it's my first stream. Kind of want to address some things, and there's a lot. I have a lot of opinions about a lot of other stuff, you know. And I've been, I think, a lot about these things. I've been thinking quite a bit, listening to a lot of opposition from both ends, and I feel like there's a lot of reasonable uh, positions from, you know, many different directions. But I also do believe that there's some places that are more reasonable than others. <laughs> if that makes sense. Like this whole idea that I remember when Trump was like, there's good people on both sides. Like, I don't disagree with this premise, but clearly one side is coming there with a very strong position that I think most people disagree with, you know? So the whole good people on both sides argument, uh, this is specifically the Charlottesville incident, right? Uh, is <laughs> doesn't hold strength. It's not a very reasonable response to that, you know? And let's be clear like the way that a lot of like people who are in nazi affiliation and kkk affiliation they usually convert or like be desensitized to that culture of thinking when people reach out to them as humans right and find why do they find these groups and find a home there and it's usually some so, sort of association of connection and community and belonging right so the very act of saying that they are something else of like something that they don't belong in your society only makes them stay stronger in the one society and culture of thinking that we all don't really agree with you know what i mean it's actually counterproductive and i think that in the last few years we've only seen the ramifications of that approach of just straight up calling people baddies you know like <laughs> And then not in the, the Gen Z way, but in the, you know, the boomer way, like there's a bunch of bad people everywhere. I mean, this is the very thing that we get really pissed about whenever we see a lot of our leaders just generalized from people calling uh, uh, individuals deplorables versus calling them a bunch of rapists and criminals. Like this is not a great tool at all. And I'm going to try to get us back on track. And I think art is a great tool for this as well i'm beginning to start to develop a project and projects um, where i am going to help both in creating a portfolio helping people learn how to do that by just watching these streams by me actually creating portfolio pieces per stream uh, whether it takes me a series of streams to finish one piece or a series of pieces i'll do it all on here so you guys can watch it and see it happen live and then use that tool uh, as well as talking about any kind of, you know, industry news as well as, you know, world news and try to grasp it from a more positive, more uplifting, but also very realistic position as much as humanly possible. I'm not versed in this. I'm not like a, uh, what you call it, um, expert by no means, but I am what I would like to believe a normie. Like, I think I have a pretty general opinion a very neutral opinion to most of these things that i think most people can subscribe to you know what i mean and uh, i think i can try to you know get people to start to think about each other as individuals again and helping each other out man instead of just start 
separating and separating and separating and separating, you know? <clears throat> but anyway, yeah, see, like I said, there's definitely people have their opinions and it's always going to be very strong. But I do, uh, I do believe that we can have more of this discussion and you'll see, it'll be more of a positive and uplifting one. I have a Discord too, so it'll be great to bring people on and talk and have great discussions. You know what I mean? And begin to, like I said, build the community from the ground up a little bit. Help each other out. Anyways, I'm going to go ahead and end the stream now. Thanks again, everybody, for hanging out. I appreciate y'all. Much love. And uh, I'll talk to you guys when I talk to you guys. Cheers. See ya.